Our New Testament reading is from Matthew. This is a continuation of Matthew 13. We have been in the middle of Matthew this summer. This continues uh, the uh, thought of Jesus and the series of parables that he is teaching. And this particularly, uh, a couple of parables here and a word on on, uh, why Jesus speaks in parables. Listen for God's word. This is uh, chapter 13, verses 31 through 36. Listen for God's word. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of story and your story. We thank you for a word which is rich and needs to be massaged only in our hearts. We thank you for eyes to see with, ears to hear with, and we thank you for the gift of spirit that helps us to do both see and hear. Open up this word for our understanding. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a week ago... We finished a a week of Hero Central Vacation Bible School that was, by all accounts, very successful. The leadership was great. The theme and the decor were perfect. The Bible stories were engaging, and 66 very, very, very active 4 through 11-year-olds attended, many of whom struggled to stay focused. I was in the Bible Center each day introducing another hero story from the Bible, and I struggled to keep their attention. I practiced the sign language, God's heroes have heart. Thank you, Nancy Jones is helping me with this. God's heroes have courage. And so it went. I changed set directions to shake it up a little bit. I memorized the sequence of stories so that they wouldn't see me looking at my notes. I used costumes and funny hats. I jumped around. I got louder. I went over good listening skills with them daily. I called out their names. I sent them to different sections of the rooms when they started touching each other. I put teachers between them. But they had a hard time focusing. By Wednesday, I was discouraged and tired. I didn't know what else to do. I was dragging into the classroom and I was dreading that the next group was coming. For some reason, my teen assistants seemed to be more easygoing about the whole thing. Maybe they were distracted, too. Okay, I said to myself, deep breath in, deep breath out. Let's remember the stories about God's heroes. And they were already starting to roll around on the floor and fiddle with the strings of the window blinds. And I began with the hand signals. Yesterday, we learned that God's heroes have courage. 
and they did the hand signs with me. And who was our hero? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Actually, there were crickets. No one said a word. The one rolling around on the floor rolled by me. <laughs> and as he rolled by me, he said, Abigail. And he kept rolling. And I stopped. I stopped all my jumping around. I stopped all my arm waving. I stopped all my squatting down and getting in their faces and calling out names because he was right. It was Abigail, an obscure character in an obscure story of David as a young warrior. But it was an important story of a courageous woman married to an evil landowner, and she risked her life to help God's people. That was Abigail, and he got it. This wiggly, distracted, distracting boy. Against all probability, he got it. God's heroes have courage. The story of Abigail tells us that. Jesus threw around stories all the time. You get a good feel for that here in Matthew's gospel, particularly in this 13th chapter. Today's scripture is a continuation of the parables. Dan's been preaching on the parables of the sower and it'll show up again. And here are a series of parables, stories that are taken from real life. So we imagine that Jesus is walking the roads with the disciples, sitting on a hill with some followers, seeing a farmer or someone fishing or a woman kneading bread in her home. And Jesus begins to teach a lesson on what our intangible, invisible God is like based on something very tangible that's around them every day. And the way Jesus does it is worth noting as well. He throws it out there and then he lets it rest. He doesn't beat the lesson to death and he doesn't stand on his head trying to draw attention to it. He's not squatting down, getting in their faces. He's not calling out their names. He's throwing it out there. And that's what parable means. It doesn't mean story. Parable means to throw around, to throw alongside of. A parable is a seemingly random phrase or story that is thrown about, but it's not random at all. In fact, it is sacred. It is holy. That is not the way my VBS Bible storytelling felt. I explained. I explained my explanation. I explained it emphasizing particular words, and meanwhile, they quit listening. Jesus, on the other hand, throws a story out there, and with a knowing nod to his disciples, he says to them, get it? Do you get it? And quite literally later, he's going to say, do you understand? And the disciples, eagerly, because they want to get it, nod and and they say, yes, but who among us would believe that they really did understand? Jesus doesn't challenge their response. He's not worried if you don't get it. Because your getting it is the Spirit's work. And some were meant to and, and some will not. And just because others don't, the power of the parable is not lessened. It is good stuff. It is good seed that Jesus is throwing out there. And some will understand it and grab hold of it, but not everyone. 
It has been said that Jesus is in the business of bringing us into God's story. God's story has been happening all around us forever. It's just that we've been too distracted to see it, to hear it. Jesus comes along and he starts tossing around parables like seeds and they're flying here and there and everywhere and some of them are taking root and others are struggling. But let it be known that the story is out there. The kingdom of God is like begins Jesus and everybody's ears perk up. This is not just a good story, it's the story that they've been waiting for. The significance of kingdom, it might be lost on us 21st century Americans because we don't really talk in terms of kingdoms. We talk in terms of democracies and opportunities and equal rights. But Matthew's first audience is interested in kingdom. It's what they have been waiting for. Matthew begins his gospel by showing that Jesus is part of a kingdom. He shows Jesus' pedigree. It's this outline of where Jesus came from. His, his, he's descended from a royal line. Matthew goes on to say that kings will be threatened by him. Kings will come to worship him. So when Jesus begins to talk in terms of kingdom, everyone starts to listen. By virtue of this king, Israel would once again be a powerful people. Now we do understand something of that language. If ushering in a future leader means that we will be in first place or exalted or have power and privilege, then we're all about that. But we know that Jesus starts talking about kingdom and he's talking about heaven on earth. And he's, he's saying it quite literally. His kingdom language, as Jesus starts to use it, he uses these very common stories about very ordinary people. Not exalted <clears throat> stories. And that's the whole point. As Christians, we are called to believe in the incarnation the mystery of where the divine and the human come together in the person of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' parable, he puts that incarnational focus not on himself, but he's putting the incarnational focus on the world around us, that God is present, like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like the most common things in human life, like Jesus himself, this everyday world embodies the sacred meaning of human, human and divine. If only we have ears to see and ears to hear and eyes to see. And in that embodiment, Jesus' parable shows no fable or myth or God or in human disguise or, or talking animals or well, only real life women and men going about their everyday work. Jesus tells stories that we can touch, that make sense to us. And if we can touch them and it makes sense, then we might understand who God is. For Jesus, God's realm is not a lofty kingdom in the sweet by and by, but it's as close as the next mustard bush or loaf of bread. Jesus is in the business of bringing us into God's story. When Jesus talks about kingdom, he is saying, this is what it's like in that place where God's in charge. God's kingdom does not look like, nor is it dictated by earthly laws. And Jesus wants to send that message that God's kingdom has already begun to take shape among us, but not everyone is going to get it. 
And the only way to know God's kingdom is by being willing to see what is happening around you in a very new way. A very disturbing thing happened in this past week in Cocoa Beach. A group of five teenagers, ages 14 to 16, watched a man drowning in a nearby lake, and they laughed and taunted him and filmed it with their cell phones. And they did nothing to help, and they did not report it, and it did not come to light until days later when one of the boys posted it on his Facebook page. The police are looking into appropriate punishment for the boys, but noted that the boys broke no law because there is no law that says you must help someone who is in trouble. This is heartbreaking. While their actions are reprehensible and morally outrageous, they committed no crime. In 2012, in a legal argument, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy summarized that across the U.S. there is no general duty to render aid to a person in danger. Florida state law and general U.S. law do not require it. The Coco Mayor Henry Parrish responded to all this, never in my life would I have thought that we would need a law to make someone help someone else. A Pharisee, a teacher of the Hebraic law, wanted to test Jesus. And he said, what is the greatest among God's law in that place where God's in charge? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, you know this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And Jesus said, adding, you shall love your neighbor just like you love yourself. The first law of God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, would have shown up subversively very differently if one of these boys, perhaps the youngest, perhaps the most quiet, and the weakest among them, not le legally obligated, but whose heart is stirred and having the courage to take a risk, grabs the cell phone out of another's hand, dials 911, rushes to the drowning man yelling, hold on, help is coming, you are loved, you are worth everything to God. God's heroes. I cannot help but think these young men are our obligation, the church's children. Where did they get the idea that it is okay to stand off to the side while a person drowns? Where did they miss the teaching, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? Where did they miss that? The places where God shows up, or rather where we recognize that God is already at work, are those places where something is beginning to grow, stir, blossom, create good, create a greater good. Unusual moments of cooperation and care, breakthroughs, acts of kindness, of decency, of mercy, even where no mercy was merited, places of generosity. Get it? Dictated by a law of love, God's kingdom wants to change this world through us. It's subtle. It's subversive. And we have to do it.